Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much this morning for bringing us here to ASI. We thank you for the privilege of being at meetings like this where we can come and fellowship and learn more truths and interact. And I just pray that you would be with me in a special way over the next hour or so. As we go through this message, may the message be clear. May you give me just the words to speak, and may it help us to be more prepared for the soon coming of Jesus. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, I want to welcome you here to our seminar this morning. This is the first in a series of four presentations on prophecy. Um, Later today, Michael Haas will be doing a seminar, and then tomorrow morning, Lewis Walton, and then tomorrow afternoon, Greg Hamilton. So that's the four presentations on prophecy. And the first presentation this morning is entitled, Adventism's Prophetic Role in the Great Controversy. Now, you realize that we as Seventh-day Adventists have a very unique and special role to fulfill in the great controversy between Christ and Satan, right? We are not just any other group of people, amen? We have a special message and a special mission to take to the world. But in order for us to accomplish that mission... We need to allow God to do a special work in our lives. So we are going to be looking at our prophetic role in the great controversy, and I hope this will give you some fresh ideas, perhaps looking at things in a way that it's familiar concepts, but presented in a way that you haven't thought of exactly in the same way before. And I'm just going to give you a couple of quotes to start off. Why do we study prophecy? Why is prophecy such a big deal to us as Seventh-day Adventists? Well, here's a statement from Testimonies to Ministers, page 113. And this statement says, The book of Revelation opens with an injunction to us to understand the instruction that it contains. When we as a people understand what this book means to us, there will be seen among us a great revival. And, you know, sometimes you hear people say, oh, I'm tired of studying beasts and horns and that kind of thing. Well, if people are tired of studying beasts and horns, it could be that they haven't studied the book of Revelation and Daniel correctly. Because when you study the book of Daniel and Revelation correctly, you will see that there's a lot more than beasts and horns. Next statement. Testimonies to Ministers, page 116. Those who eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God will bring from the books of Daniel and Revelation truth that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. They will start into action forces that cannot be repressed. The lips of children will be opened to proclaim the mysteries that have been hidden from the minds of men. Listen, if you want to be partaking of the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to be studying the books of Daniel and Revelation, and you're going to bring truths from those books that are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and this will start into action forces that cannot be repressed. And my friends, that's talking talking about the loud cry of the latter rain that will bring this work to a close. So we find in these books the message that will start into action forces that cannot be repressed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we def- this is why we study prophecy. This is why we look into these things. Now, what we're going to be looking at today especially, we're going to be looking at the 2300-year prophecy, 2300-day prophecy in connection with the 70 weeks. And we're going to see, hopefully, some things that we don't think about so much. But what is our identity as Seventh-day Adventists? Well, of course, we see the 2300-day prophecy. We see that that prophecy takes us down to 1844. We see that that prophecy uh, tells us the time of the investigative judgment being inaugurated. We see that we are the judgment hour people identified in Revelation chapter 14. And sometimes when I look around our church today, I wonder... Have we forgotten our identity? Why are we trying to be like Willow Creek? Why are we trying to be like the churches, let's just put it frankly here, the churches of Babylon? Now, God has his people in the churches of Babylon, don't get me wrong. God says, come out of her, my people. But that does not mean that we go to Babylon to say, let's see how we can be like you. 
No, we're supposed to be the head and not the tail. We are supposed to be calling people out and showing them from Scripture what the truth is for our time. We need to get over this identity crisis that we're having as a people. We need to get back to our true identity. And I'm hoping that as you see this presentation this morning, you will gain a clearer picture of just exactly what our identity is. And what role does the 2300-day prophecy have? We're going to look in greater detail at this prophecy. Now, the importance of the 2300 days. Why is this prophecy so important? You know, I hear some people say, oh, I'm so tired of talking about the 2300 days. Let's just talk about Jesus. Have any of you ever heard anybody say that? Okay. Well, if someone says that, it's because they don't really understand the 2300-day prophecy. Because the 2300-day prophecy is identifying what Jesus is doing right now in heaven. So if we want to talk about Jesus, let's talk about what he is doing now for us as identified by prophecy. So the importance of the 2300 days, this is Great Controversy, page 409, paragraph 1. The scripture, which above all others had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Notice, Ellen White says, this is the scripture above all others. This is the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Found in Daniel 8.14. And I think you're going to see why this scripture is the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith. Listen, this foundational scripture, this central pillar of scripture to our faith is more than just a time prophecy. This prophecy takes us to an understanding of the sanctuary message and of what Jesus is doing in heaven, and it's designed to place our focus on what Jesus is doing right now. And in line with that thought, let's go to our next statement. Great Controversy, page 423. The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. Now, notice this carefully. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it brought to light the position and work of his people. Listen. The sanctuary message, which is identified through the 2300-day prophecy, unlocks a complete system of truth that is connected and harmonious. Listen, as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to understand more than ever before at this time of Earth's history that God has given to us a complete system of truth. It's time to stop being ashamed of the complete system of truth that God has given to us. It's like, oh, I don't really want to talk about the sanctuary, and boy, don't talk about the spirit of prophecy. That's going to offend people. And we get all defensive about our message when if we were being led by the Spirit, we would be excited to show people the complete system of truth that God has given to us. We don't need to be ashamed of our doctrines. Now is not the time to start removing pillars of truth from our faith. We have a complete system of truth that is connected and harmonious. And notice, it reveals present duty as as it brought to light the position and work of his people. So we we have a lot to be thankful for. Now it's one other statement. And I love this statement. This is Testimonies, Volume 5, page 575. The great plan of redemption as revealed in the closing work of these last days should receive close examination. The scenes connected with the sanctuary above should make such an impression upon the minds and hearts of all that they may be able to impress others. All need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement which is going on in the sanctuary above. Now notice this. When this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God, and their efforts will be successful. 
By study, contemplation, and prayer, God's people will be elevated above common earthly thoughts and feelings and will be brought into harmony with Christ and his great work of cleansing the sanctuary above from the sins of the people. Listen, Ellen White makes it very clear. We need to give the great plan of redemption a close examination. And when we do, the scenes connected in the sanctuary above will make such an impression upon our mind and heart that we're going to go out and share it with others so that they will be impressed. We need to have that level of an experience with God, not only just having a relationship with Jesus, but a relationship that is connected to what he is doing in heaven so that we will impress others with what he is doing in heaven on our behalf. And when we do this, we will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God. Do you want to be doing that? That's our work. We are to be working to prepare a people to stand in the day of God, the great day of God. And when we do so, it says our efforts will be successful. You know, we come up with all sorts of schemes to reach people. And, and, and it's good to understand where people are coming from, their cultural backgrounds and things of that nature. I lived in Trinidad for two years. And so, yes, you want to understand where people are coming from. But at the end of the day, truth is truth. And you can come up with all sorts of interesting plans, but at the end of the day, we need to learn how to present this truth in a way that it will impress their hearts and minds so that they will get excited about this message. Now, having said that, this is what I've come to the conclusion to. The prophecy of the 2300 days is the engine in the vehicle that drives Adventism. Now, you may be saying, come on, Norman, the 2300-day prophecy? What about Jesus? Well, my point is this. The 2300 days takes us to what Jesus is doing right now. It is Christ-centered. It is Christ-focused. It is present truth that is showing us what Jesus is doing in heaven right now. This prophecy connects the life, work, and death of Jesus on earth with his work and ministry in heaven today. It's a complete package. We don't just talk about Jesus on the cross. We talk about him in the sanctuary in heaven. We don't just talk about Jesus in the sanctuary in heaven. We talk about his ministry here on earth and his death on the cross. It all goes together. Okay. Now, it's not surprising that this key central pillar of our faith came under attack in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In fact, I think most of you here in this room remember when Desmond Ford came out with his attack against the sanctuary message. How many of you, it was as if yesterday that Desmond Ford did did this? uh, I know several of you. And I'll have to admit, I was only two years old when he made his famous speech at Pacific Union College. So I was a baby then. But listen, as I've gotten older, and as I've come to love our truth and our message, and I saw, uh, I've studied what Desmond Ford said, you know, you read what he says... And it makes you wonder why were so many people deceived by him. Because once you get below the initial layer of what he's saying, it's so easy to refute his points. I'll just give you a few examples. I mean, he says that the little horn of Daniel 8 is Antiochus Epiphanes, and then he hides behind non adventist scholars to sustain his view. And, I mean, it's clearly unsustainable. I mean, the ram waxed great. The he-goat waxed very great. The little horn waxed exceeding great. Daniel 8 makes it very clear in verse 20. The ram is Medo-Persia. Verse 21, the he-goat is Greece. And then you're telling me one king out of the kingdom of Greece was exceeding great when he only reigned for a few years? And that's the best the Babylonian scholarship can come up with? And yet, Seventh-day Adventists who weren't studying were like, oh, man... He's got some good arguments that I've never thought of before. I guess what we believed isn't true. You know, that should be a lesson to us that we need to know much better what we believe. Someone like that who hides behind his doctoral degree and comes along and tries to make it look like Seventh-day Adventists don't really know what they're talking about. We as God's people can study for ourselves and defend the truth that God has given to us. And of course, it's not surprising that because Ellen White made it very clear that the 2300 days was the foundational prophecy of our faith, Desmond Ford had to undermine the credibility of Ellen White, right? He said that she had devotional value, but she was not inspired. And I'll tell you what, 
if you think that Desmond Ford came and went, you haven't been paying attention to our church. Because the theology that he brought into the church in the late 1970s is bearing fruit today. Because you see, Desmond Ford didn't just go after the 2300 days. He also, the, you know why he went after the 2300 days? He said that, the, the, that his view and understanding of the gospel, his gospel of grace, forced him to throw out the doctrine of the investigative judgment. Because the gospel of grace, you're covered by the righteousness of Christ even while you're continuing to sin. He would talk about how Ellen White says perfect health requires perfect circulation, so if you cross your legs, you're sinning, you know, that kind of stuff. And he went off on all sorts of foolish stuff. But at the end of the day, he was saying this concept of an investigative judgment where God reviews the record of your life goes against the gospel of grace because the the Bible teaches that you're going to keep sinning till Jesus comes. You just need grace to cover you. And so what's the purpose of having your, the record of your life reviewed? That's what Desmond Ford was saying. And he's like, what's, this, what's the purpose of a sanctuary being cleansed? Because it won't be cleansed before probation closes. It, I mean, sin will exist till Jesus comes. That's what Desmond Ford taught. You're aware of that, right? And so that's why he went after the sanctuary doctrine. But here's what happens. When we as Seventh-day Adventists study the sanctuary message and see it as a complete system of truth, we realize that as Christ is cleansing the sanctuary in heaven above, he is cleansing us from sin here on this earth. And that we really can have victory over sin in this life. And so there's a lot going on. And so what happens is Desmond Ford introduced ideas, concepts from, uh, of, of a gospel that was different than what Adventists had historically believed and taught. And now most, well, I don't know, many Seventh-day Adventists, without even perhaps realizing it, have an understanding of the gospel that is more similar to, De- to Desmond Ford's than what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy teach. And that's a problem. So we're going to keep going here and see what truth really says. What is our typical understanding of the 2300-day prophecy? I'll just give you in a nutshell what Seventh-day Adventists do. And this is all good. What I'm going to say is, is good, but it's not the whole picture. When we look at the 2300-day prophecy, we say, oh, okay, there's this 2300 day prophecy in Daniel chapter 814. And when we look at Daniel chapter 814, we don't know the starting point. So how do we get the starting point? Oh, we go to Daniel chapter 9 and we get to verse 24 and it says 70 weeks are determined, which means cut off. Oh, it's cut off from the 2300 days and then it starts at the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. And that decree was given in the seventh year of Artaxerxes according to Ezra 7 verses 13 and 14. And the, according to the canon of Ptolemy, The seventh year of Artaxerxes is 457 B.C., so there we go. And that's what we do with the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, right? That's typically what we do, and that's good. That's an excellent understanding of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days and how they are connected. There's more to it, but there's a lot more to it than that. And that's what I want to spend some time looking at. Before I get into any more detail. I just want to give you one example, though, of how to show that the 2300-day prophecy is a day-for-year prophecy. When you look at Daniel chapter 8, Daniel goes into vision in verse 2, and the word in in the Hebrew is hazon, and he's in vision, and he's the word for vision here, hazon, means to describe what he sees. What does he see? He sees a ram in verse, verses 3 and 4, he sees a hego in verses 5 and 6. He sees the hego destroy the ram in verse 7, and the hego waxes great in verse 8. And then he sees a little horn come up in verse 9, and all the way down through verse 12. And then the question is asked, how long, in verse 13, the question is asked, how long shall be the vision? Do you see that? Well, what's in the vision that Daniel sees? A ram, a hego, and a little horn. And then the little horn magnifies itself against the prince of the host, and he tramples the truth under the ground. He attacks the sanctuary and God's people. And so you have the ram of Medo-Persia, the he-goat of Greece, the little horn of pagan, and then papal Rome. And then the question is, how long shall be the vision? Well, what's the answer? 2,300 days. Now, if you have any logic, you would say, okay, well, 
the, the vision encapsulates the kingdom of Medo-Persia, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of pagan Rome, and the kingdom of papal Rome. Do you think, then, that 2,300 days is describing literal time? That's what Desmond Ford said it was. But if all you have to do is use some common sense. No, clearly, the 2,300 days is encapsulating these major kingdoms. And so it has to be a a day-for-year prophecy because there's no way that the 2,300 days could be literal time and take in all those kingdoms. Do you see that? And that's just one illustration of many of how you can undermine Desmond Ford's arguments. So when we look at the 2,300 days, that gives us some understanding. But let's take a deeper look now. What is the deeper meaning? How should we understand the connection of the 70 weeks and the 2,300 days? And how does this help us to understand Adventism's prophetic identity? Well, you know, Daniel 8, 14, we've read that. I want us to take some time now and read Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. So get out your Bibles, open them up to Daniel chapter 9, and we are going to read verses 24 through 27. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, shall the Messiah the Prince, uh, or sorry, and to the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay. So this is the section of Daniel that helps us to understand the beginning point to the 2300 days. It says 70 weeks are determined, and the Hebrew word there is katak, which means to cut off. But there's a lot more that's being talked about here in this section than just helping us to know the starting point for the 2300 days, right? So 70 weeks are cut off or determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to do what? Notice what it says. Finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Do you think that's important? Do we talk about this very often? What I'm going to show you right now is how this connects with the 2300 days. Listen, 70 weeks are cut off from the 2300 days, but in these 70 weeks we see that Messiah the Prince will be coming. And when he comes, his purpose is to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. Now, when we look at this, when you look at the first four points here, you see that God's purpose in the 70 weeks, is to deal with the sin problem, right? Because all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Sin has been a problem here on this earth ever since Adam and Eve sinned. And so there's four specific points that talk about dealing with the sin problem. Now, how did Christ deal with this sin problem in the 70 weeks? His death on the cross, right? So this is pretty basic, pretty obvious, but here's the thing. Jesus dies on the cross to deal with the sin problem, but let me ask you a question. Did sin cease to exist when Jesus died on the cross? No, it did not. Sin has continued to be an issue. We have not yet seen the everlasting righteousness brought in. But what Jesus did on the cross 
begin that work that was necessary to deal with the sin problem. Do you see that? To make an end of sin, to finish the transgression, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. And the question is, can we identify a time in prophecy where the sin problem will be dealt with once and for all? Well, it just so happens that the 70 weeks are cut off from the 2300 days, and when you get to the end of the 2300 days, it says, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's Day of Atonement language, when the sins of God's people would be blotted out. So here's what you're seeing. Theologically, the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are connected as well, not to just give you a starting point for the 2300 days so that you know it's 457 B.C. to 1844. It's also showing you what Jesus is accomplishing in dealing with the sin problem. He starts with the sin problem when he dies on the cross, but he will finish dealing with the sin problem when he goes into the most holy place in 1844. Does that make sense? Okay, now, those are the first four points. But notice the two other things that are mentioned here in Daniel chapter 9. It says, seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Now, when it says seal up the vision and prophecy, the word seal up means to ratify. What vision and prophecy did Jesus ratify with with his death on the cross? It's the vision of the 2300 days. Do you realize that the 2300 days is so important that Jesus' death ratified it? And why did that vision and prophecy need to be ratified or sealed up? Because his death guaranteed that a day would come that he would take his blood and with his blood blot out our sins. But he could not ratify the vision without his blood. If Jesus doesn't die, we don't get to 1844 at least as far as the sanctuary being cleansed. But because Jesus died in 31 AD, we get to 1844. So Jesus' death ratifies the vision and prophecy of the 2300 days. And then it says, he anointed the most holy. Now the word in the Hebrew for most holy is kodesh kodeshim. And that means sanctuary. And so when Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood... His blood inaugurated the work of the sanctuary. Okay. Now, that gives us some understanding of what the 2300 days is all about, or I mean the 70 weeks, in connection to the 2300 days. Let's look a little bit more at the 2300 days. Now, here we see, under 2300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. The word in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word nizdak. Now, how many of you have studied this out, the meaning of the Hebrew word in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14? Just so I know who I'm talking to here. Has anybody studied this out? A few of you have. Many of you have not. So I'm going to explain this. So when it says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, the word cleansed is nizdak. Now, do you know what this word means in the Hebrew? Nizdak? It actually means justified. And that's one of the things that Desmond Ford said. See, it's not even talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, but... The word nizdak comes from the word sadak, the Hebrew word sadak, which means to be justified or to be set right or to be vindicated. But what Desmond Ford didn't understand, and I'll show you, is that throughout the Old Testament, this Hebrew word nizdak, which comes from, or sadak, which comes from nizdak, is in parallel with another Hebrew word taher, which means to cleanse. Let me just give you a few verses. Turn in your Bible to Job chapter 4, verse 17. Job chapter 4, verse 17. And here we read, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Notice the, the, the parallel there. Shall man be more just than God? Shall he be more pure than God? Just and pure are put together. You see this again, and I'm not going to take the time to read all the verses, but you see the very same thing in Job 17, verse 9, Psalms 19, verse 9, and Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 2. Here's, what, here's how the Hebrew mind operates. If you say justified, you also mean that you're pure. 
If you say justified, you also mean that you're clean. The, the two go together. It's like justification and sanctification. And in the modern world today, we try to separate out justification and sanctification and say that justification means everything and sanctification don't worry about it, when in reality, they go together hand in hand. Okay. So when it says under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be justified, it also means, yes, cleansed. It also means to be set right or to be vindicated. And in that, there is an element of the vindication of God that is being described here. Now, this is what I've come to understand. What Jesus began on the cross, according to the 70 weeks and the 2300 days as they are connected, what Jesus began on the cross, he finishes in the sanctuary, specifically the most holy place. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, we've known this for a while, but I'm just showing you how it's connected between these two prophecies. Now, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to spend some time showing you a big picture look of how the sanctuary being cleansed and how how God has raised up a people through whom he will cleanse the sanctuary, how this is all over the books of Daniel and Revelation when you look at the big picture. Now, we can get into the detail, but we're going to especially look at the big picture here. So the book Daniel means God is my judge, so it's all about judgment. And, of course, the cleansing of the sanctuary is first mentioned in this book, So in Daniel chapter 2, we see the promise of the second coming. The stone is going to strike the image, and Jesus is going to come. We don't yet know, of course, no man knows the day or the hour. We don't know when the second coming is going to take place. All we know is that according to this foundational prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, at some point Jesus is coming in the clouds of heaven. Then when we come to Daniel chapter 7, we see that after the kingdoms of this world, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the the dreadful beast, and then the little horn, there is a judgment in heaven where Christ, the Son of Man, comes in the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days, and then the judgment is set and the books are open. But now we know, based on the 2300 days and, and its connection to the judgment, that this work began in 1844. So now things are becoming a little bit clearer. When we come to Daniel chapter 8, we see in the sequence of kingdoms after the ram of Medo-Persia, the he-goat of Greece, and the little horn of Rome, that the sanctuary is cleansed, and this is 1844. And by the way, you may wonder why Babylon is missing from the 2300-day prophecy in the chapter of Daniel chapter 8. It's found in Daniel 2, it's found in Daniel 7, but it's missing in chapter 8 because the 2300-day prophecy starts during the kingdom of Medo-Persia, so Babylon is not relevant to that prophecy. And then when we come to Daniel chapter 11... 10, 11, and 12, this gives us even greater detail. And as we come to the end of the kingdoms of this world, Michael stands up, probation closes, and that happens just before Jesus comes. And again, we don't know exactly when that's going to take place. When you look at the big picture, this is what you see. Daniel 2 tells us Jesus is coming back in the clouds of heaven. We know that. But in order for Jesus to come back, there must be a judgment to take place in which the saints are given the kingdom as a result of the judgment, right? That's what Daniel 7 says at the end of the chapter, that the saints are given the kingdom as a result of the judgment. Well, in order for the saints to be given the kingdom in the judgment, the sanctuary in heaven must be cleansed. Christ will not give his kingdom to saints who are not cleansed of sin. Do you see that? So Jesus is coming back, but in order for him to come back, he must have a judgment. And when he has a judgment, he will give the kingdom to his saints. But in order for him to give the kingdom to his saints, he must have a sanctuary that is cleansed because the lives of his saints have been cleansed from sin. And when the sanctuary is cleansed, Michael will stand up and probation will close. That's, the, per, that's, that's the, the overall big picture message of the book of Daniel. Isn't that pretty neat? How those four prophecies connect. There will be a second coming. We don't know when it's going to be. The judgment begins in 1844. Sanctuary cleansing begins in 1844. Probation closes. And each of those prophecies shows us what needs to take place for Jesus to come back. Now here's the very interesting thing. If you're looking at that graph very carefully, you see 
that the focus of prophecy is between 1844 to the second coming, right? That should wake us up a little bit, should it not? We shouldn't just be living lives business as usual, right? It's like when the economy starts to tank a little bit. It's like, oh, uh, been there, done that before. I don't think Jesus is coming anytime soon. Really? Is that your attitude as a Seventh-day Adventist? When we study prophecy, we see that the focus of prophecy throughout history is from 1844 to the second coming. And so studying the book of Daniel gives us an understanding of just how important our judgment hour message is. This complete system of truth that is connected and harmonious throughout the prophecies. And then we come to the book of Revelation, and I love studying the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a book that's not revealing beasts and horns. When it does describe beasts and horns, it's describing the antagonist to Christ. But the book of Revelation is all about showing who Jesus is and how he is revealed. Now, in a special way, in the seven churches, in the seven seals, and in the seven trumpets, we see God's plan to deal with the sin problem. Because remember, in the 70 weeks, you're going to see the finishing of the transgression, making an end of sin, making reconciliation for iniquity, and bringing in everlasting righteousness. Well, Revelation is showing us how that takes place. When we look at the seven churches, when we come to the end of the seven churches, we see that Jesus stands at the door of Laodicea's heart and he says, let me come in. And you know, I think I'll take a few moments to talk about the Laodicean message. Have you read what Ellen White says about the Laodicean message in early writings, page 270? She says that she was asked the meaning of the shaking that she had seen and was shown that it would be brought forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean church. And when you read the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean church, Jesus says, you, th you are my judgment hour church. Laodicea means a judge people. And Jesus says, my judgment hour church whom I love so much, you say that you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then he says, I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. What's Laodicea's problem? Laodicea says, we're rich, we're increased with goods, we don't need anything. And Jesus says, actually, in order for you to be rich, you need to buy gold tried in the fire. Well, what's that gold tried in the fire? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, it's the trial of your faith that is much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Here's what Laodicea is saying. We have faith because gold tried in the fire is faith. Laodicea is saying, we're rich because we have faith. We have righteousness by faith. We have saving faith. We have assurance of salvation. We're just going to wait till Jesus comes and everything's going to be great. And Jesus says, this is a big problem. Because you think you have righteousness by faith and in reality, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Now listen, if you are naked, you do not have the righteousness of Christ. And yet, as, as a Laodicean church, we're like, oh yeah, we're a little lukewarm. We're not too hot. We're not too cold. We just need to get a little bit more on fire for Jesus. And yet Jesus is saying, you are lacking righteousness by faith. And yet Laodicea is saying, no, we have righteousness by faith. We're fine. We are rich. We're increased with goods. We don't need anything else. We don't want to do that gold tried in the fire thing because that would mean we'd have to go through the trials of life and learn to really trust in Jesus. We don't want that. And this is what brings a shaking to the church because when the message comes to the church to prepare a people for cleansing, to have the gold tried in the fire so that the sins in our lives will be removed so that we can be cleansed of sin, we say, no, don't tell me that. I just want a message that gives me assurance of salvation but doesn't require me to surrender my life to Jesus. And so Laodicea is supposed to be and is the church of the judgment hour that is being prepared to be cleansed of sin. 
so that Jesus can finish his work in the sanctuary in his great controversy battle with Satan. And yet Laodicea, in many respects, has been deceived into a false understanding of the gospel which causes us to be complacent about our Christian experience. Oh, I can just have a relationship with Jesus, but I'll keep sinning until he comes. That's a false gospel. And, you know, if you go through the elements of the Laodicean message, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, the word wretched is the Greek word talaeperos. It's found one other place in the New Testament. Do you know, do you know where that's found? Romans 7. O oh, wretched man that I am, the good that I would, I do not. That which I do, I allow not. So I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things that I want to do. Oh, that's just the Christian experience on the way to heaven. That was Paul's experience. That's my experience. That's righteousness by faith. Oh, well. And Jesus is saying, no, if that's your experience, you're naked. But the problem with Laodicea is we're blind so that we don't see that true condition. And so when Jesus, as the true witness, gives this straight message to the church, this will bring a shaking to God's people. And so Jesus is saying... After he says all of this, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Why is Jesus standing at the door and knocking? It's because Laodicea has let Jesus outside of our lives. We want Jesus on the outside. We want the covering of his righteousness. But please don't come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I'll take you as my Savior, but please don't be my Lord. That's what Laodicea is saying, without realizing it. And Jesus is saying, I love you too much to leave you in this condition. And so Jesus is saying, please let me come in. And then in the very next verse, he says, in verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Now you realize, 1 John 5 verse 4 says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Jesus overcame by his faith. If we overcome as he overcame, we overcome by the faith of Jesus. That's the third angel's message. Laodicea is lacking the experience of the third angel's message, which is designed to cleanse us from the sin in our lives. But so often we have not wanted the experience of the third angel's message. We want the form of godliness. We want Jesus to cover us, but we don't want him to cleanse us. And yet Jesus is saying the purpose for your existence as Seventh-day Adventist is to be cleansed of sin in your lives so that I can finish the work in the sanctuary in heaven. Jesus began that work on the cross, and he went into the most holy place in 1844 to finish it. But he's got a problem right now, because Laodicea isn't letting him finish that work. And Jesus is saying, please let me come in. So that's the message in the seven churches. Now as we move forward here, we come to Revelation chapter 6 and 7 and the message of the seven seals. And somehow, from God's last day church, we see that the 144,000 are sealed. You know, I am so thankful that when I study the message of Revelation, I realize that even though God's people are in a terrible condition in the last days, that somehow, some way, God's people will let Jesus come in, and from that last day church, the 144,000 will come forth who are sealed with the seal of the living God. So you go down through the seals and you see the first four seals with the four horsemen and then you come to the fifth seal with the souls crying unto the altar, how long, O Lord, till you judge and avenge our blood? And then when you get to the sixth seal, suddenly you see the great Lisbon earthquake of 1755, the dark day of 1780, the falling of the stars in 1833, and the very next thing you see is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven and the wicked calling for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. And so 1833, second coming, we've been a long time now from 1833 till now. And the question is, why has Jesus not yet come back yet? Because within, in the very next section, Revelation 7, we see that the four winds are being held until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. And they will be sealed. So you know what? Every time I see a major earth event, like 9-11, like the tsunami of 2004, and even like the economic Great Depression or whatever recession that started in 2008, those are signs 
but the winds are being loosed a little bit. And God's people are waking up and becoming more ready and getting closer to being sealed. Listen, you know, I'm only 36 years old, but you see a greater awakening take, taking place in the Seventh-day Adventist church today. There are things that are happening in this church that perhaps 25 years ago were not happening, right? I mean, you've seen an awakening among young people. You have the movement like GYC, which shows that young people don't need to be entertained to come to church. And in fact, if you look at young people, many of whom I went through school with, the ones who wanted the entertainment-driven services, they're no longer in the church. So those entertainment-driven services didn't keep them in the church anyway, and if they did, they don't understand our message of Seventh-day Adventists. Our purpose is not to try to keep kids in the church just so they'll keep coming if they don't know Jesus and they're not prepared to meet him in the clouds. No, our message and our purpose as a church is to prepare each and every one to receive the seal of the living God. That's why we're here. And that's what the, the seals teaches. Then you come to the trumpets. And when you come to the end of the trumpets, you come to Revelation chapter 10, which describes the mystery of God being finished. This is the great chapter where a mighty angel comes down with a book open in his hand. He has one foot on the earth, the other on the sea, and he goes down through and he cries mightily as when a lion roareth, and then he says that time should be no longer and that the mystery of God should be finished. And the mystery of God, according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is the second Advent movement that's raised up by Jesus himself. This work was so important, Jesus didn't leave it to any other angel. He's the mighty angel. He comes down from heaven. He raises this movement up. It's based on the open book of Daniel, especially the 2300-day prophecy that points to the cleansing of the sanctuary. And this is the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And while the seventh trumpet is sounding, Jesus is saying that during the seventh trumpet sounding, which began in 1844, in this movement that I am raising up, the mystery of God is to be finished, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ outside of you, not Christ as a forensic covering. No, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's the same message as to Laodicea. He stands at the door knocking. Let me come in. You're in a Laodicea and lukewarm condition, that lacking the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is saying, let me come in. And you see that the purpose for the Advent movement is to let Jesus come in so that the mystery of God can be finished. Now, how do we let Jesus come in? Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but who? Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of who? the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's by living by the faith of Jesus. Again, that's the third angel's message. And the third angel's message is about full surrender to Jesus, being crucified with Christ, so that Christ can come in and cleanse us of sin. And then, of course, we come to the three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14, which call us to remember the everlasting gospel, to proclaim the everlasting gospel with a loud voice, to proclaim, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. And then you have the message that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and you conclude with the third angel's message. It talks about the mark of the beast, but it concludes by saying, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, there's a few points that I can make about that, but one, when God's last day people are identified as keeping the commandments of God, why do we as Seventh-day Adventists get so worried about being accused of being legalists for keeping the commandments? Listen, the Bible says that God's last day people are going to be keeping the commandments of God. Why are we trying to diminish that teaching? Because the Bible makes it very clear that God's last day people will keep the commandments of God. Now, obviously, this is not through our strength. How is it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Listen, if you let Christ come into your life, is Christ going to live an obedient life through you or a disobedient life through you? He's going to live an obedient life through you. Now, was Jesus a legalist? No. 
but he lived a perfect life, right? But that didn't make Jesus a legalist because he was connected to God. We need to stop being afraid of these terms that are thrown around and just say what the Bible says. The Bible says that through the power of God, there will be a group of people who keep the commandments of God. And when you come to Revelation chapter 12, 17, which describes the final conflict between Christ and Satan, it says, the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Is it any wonder that two of the things that are under most attack in the Seventh-day Adventist church is keeping the commandments of God and the spirit of prophecy? Because Satan knows that if God's people will stay connected to him and allow through his power and strength Christ to come in so that, they can, so that we can live an obedient life, we will also be drawn to the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, which will point out areas in our lives that we need to surrender to the Lord, which will prepare us to be ready for Jesus to come. And so what Satan does is he's like, oh, Ellen White's writings, those are so out of date, and they don't even apply anymore, and she's so strict and legalistic, and if, I've heard it, people say, oh, if all you ever did was read the testimonies, you'd become a legalist, and you hear all these things that are out there, and at the end of the day, you have to realize that these are the attacks of Satan against his last day remnant church. And yet God is raising up a group of people who are saying, we are going to keep our eyes on Jesus. We're not going to be deterred by the, the false charges. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. We're going to let him come in. And through his grace and through his strength, we will live obedient lives. We will believe in the spirit of prophecy, and we will share it with others. And so, but here's the point. When you look at the big picture, when you look at the big picture of Revelation in the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the three angels' messages. These are just different facets saying the same thing, that Jesus is working through the second advent movement to cleanse the sanctuary of sin. He does so by coming in. He stands at the door and he's knocking. He says, let me come in. When we let him come in, he cleanses us of sin and the sanctuary in heaven gets cleansed above. When he seals his 144,000, that also demonstrates that he has dealt with the sin problem. He has cleansed his saints from their sins. When the mystery of God is finished, Christ in you, the hope of glory in the second advent movement, again, the sanctuary in heaven is cleansed. And when Christ has a commandment-keeping people who keep the commandments of God, have the patience of the saints and the faith of Jesus, he has finished his work as our high priest where he is working to write his law into our hearts and minds, which cleanses us of sin. So when you look at the book of Revelation as a big picture, what you see is that in reality, the book of Revelation is describing how Jesus plans to deal with the sin problem from 1844 to the second coming. How is he going to do it? by coming into our hearts and lives and cleansing us. And that means we need to surrender. Now, this is a point pure and simple. It sounds so easy, but we all know how hard our old fallen natures fight against the call of Christ for full surrender, right? It's a lot easier to talk about this than to experience it. But through the grace and power of Jesus, he's all-powerful. We can experience it. Amen? And there have been saints down through the ages who have Enoch, Elijah, Moses, Abraham, Old Testament, all the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So this certainly is possible for each one of us. But, you know, for some Seventh-day Adventists, it's a lot more fun to talk about conspiracy theories than it is about the work that Jesus needs to do in our hearts to prepare us for the second coming. We're more interested about knowing what the Pope's doing and what the Jesuits are doing and the Illuminati and this and that and whatever, and we don't really understand, have we let Jesus come in to cleanse us so that we're actually kind and cheerful to our spouses, that we're nice and loving even when we are crossed, when things don't go our way at work or at home, we're actually showing the love of Jesus. And who cares if you don't know about conspiracy theories as long as you've surrendered your life to Jesus? The conspiracy theories aren't going to save you, and many of them probably aren't true anyway. Okay. I'll get off that soapbox, but since Brother Fournier mentioned last night, I felt at license to say it today, too. Okay. So what I want to do now, I just want to show a few things from, from Ellen White that corroborate what I've been saying. 
This is Testimonies, Volume 1, page 187. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will receive the latter rain and thus be fitted for translation. Do you realize that Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22, is the message that our church needs now to be fitted for translation? That's a translation message. It's not just a message about improvement in your Christian experience. It's a message that's going to bring the shaking and it's going to prepare God's people for translation. Because when we come up to every point and pass, stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, when we receive the latter rain and are fitted for translation, that means we've been cleansed from sin. And so when Laodicea allows Jesus to come in, he will cleanse his church of sin. That's what we need. Okay. And then cleansing in the seals, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 214. So we, from the seals, and receiving the seal of God, notice what Ellen White says, Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 214. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the de defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Listen, in order for us to receive the seal of God, which is a stamp of his character in our foreheads, by his grace and through his power, we need every sin cleansed in our lives. And you know, that's not necessarily a popular message, but let me ask you. Do you really enjoy sin? I mean, there's some sins, that, there's the pleasure of sin for a season with some sins, but I mean, do you really enjoy being bitter at that person who wronged you 20 years ago? How's that last 20 years felt for you? Oh, it's been so good to just have that grudge for 20 years. I'm so glad I've held that grudge for 20 years. Does that feel good? Really, come on. Jesus has something so much better for us. Why do we not want to be cleansed of sin? Why wouldn't we want to have the peace and freedom that comes from having sin removed from our lives? Amen? Jesus has something so much better for us. We can be cleansed through his grace and through his power. And then cleansing in the trumpets. And this ties it all together. This is Review and Herald, April 21, 1891. The latter rain is to fall upon the people of God. A mighty angel is to come down from heaven, and the whole earth is to be lighted with his glory. Are we ready to take part in the glorious work of the third angel? Are our vessels ready to receive the heavenly dew? Have we defilement and sin in the heart? If so, now notice this, let us cleanse the soul temple and prepare for the showers of the latter rain. The refreshing from the presence of the Lord will never come to hearts filled with impurity. May God help us to die to self that Christ, the hope of glory, may be formed within. So Revelation 10, Christ, the hope of glory being formed within, the mystery of God being finished, is connected with receiving the latter rain so the loud cry can go to the world so that the earth can be lightened with the glory of God. That's why the Advent movement has been raised up. And in preparation for this, we need to, be our, to have our soul temples cleansed to prepare for the showers of the latter rain. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And a personal application, this is Maranatha, page 249. From the Holy of Holies, there goes on the grand work of instruction. The angels of God are communicating to men. Christ officiates in the sanctuary. We do not follow him into the sanctuary as we should. Christ and angels work in the hearts of the children of men. The church above, united with the church below, is warring the good warfare upon the earth. Now notice this. There must be a purifying of the soul here upon the earth in harmony with Christ's cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. God's people are now to have their eyes fixed on the heavenly sanctuary where our great high priest is interceding for his people. So notice this. The sanctuary in heaven is not going to be cleansed of sin if we as God's people are not cleansed of sin here on this earth if we do not surrender our lives fully and completely to Jesus. Now, some people may take this and say, oh, well, I'm kind of enjoying this world, so I'll just keep having fun, and then when I want to come around to it, I'll get my act together, and then Jesus will finish his work. No, you better not have that attitude, because there's people all around us that are preparing themselves to receive the latter rain. 
So if you say in your heart, my Lord delays his coming, you may be left out. So Jesus is trying to get each one of us to surrender our lives to him so that we can be purified of sin. Now in the last 15 minutes, I'm just going to show a few applications from the book of Hebrews and how it culminates in Revelation 15 with the close of probation. Jesus is our high priest. What is he doing in heaven? Well, we have three passages in scripture that I want to point out. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, we see that of the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest who is set down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So what do we know about Jesus? He's our high priest seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What's he doing in verse 5? He's the mediator of a better covenant, the new covenant. And then in verses 10 through 12, what is he doing as the mediator of the new covenant? Working to write his law into our hearts and minds so that he can blot out our sins and remember our sins and iniquities no more. And as at the right hand of the throne of God, he's not only our high priest, he's the author and the finisher of our faith, helping us to run with patience the race that is set before us so that we can look unto Jesus, um, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this is what Jesus is doing in heaven right now. He's working to write his law in our hearts and minds. He's helping us to run with patience the race that is set before us so that we can overcome as he overcame through the faith of Jesus. And that's a nice little summary of Revelation 14, verse 12. So this is what Jesus is doing. Now, what I want to focus in on especially is finishing the race because this race of faith has been set before us. And I want to spend some time especially looking at Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 9, through Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. This is a great section of scripture. When you study Hebrews, you come to the faith chapter, you see all these heroes of faith who through faith conquered kingdoms, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, and conquered. And it's like, wow, they stopped the mouths of lions. I want to have that kind of faith. And yet others, to obtain a better resurrection, were slain with a sword, sawn asunder, and so forth. Just because you have faith doesn't mean you're going to escape. Some people did in the faith chapter, some people didn't, but they all had victorious faith. And after you see all of these heroes of faith, when you come to the end of Hebrews chapter 11, picking it up in verse 39, it says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, what, what is Paul saying here in Hebrews 11? This doesn't make sense. It's like after he says all of these amazing things about the faith experience of these people, it says they received not the promise. Well, what promise did they not receive? Well, when you go a few verses earlier, the promise was of a better country, a heavenly country, whose um, foundations are not on this earth, whose builder and maker is God. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. And they have not yet received it. But then it says that they without us should not be made perfect. What does Paul mean when he says these heroes of faith are not perfect without us? First of all, what does it mean to be made perfect in this context? And who is the us that Paul is talking about? The answer is in Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 4. That helps us to understand what it means to be made perfect, so to speak, and who the us that Paul is talking about. But Paul has defined what it means to be perfect. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, especially the first four verses, when he talks about being perfect, it's in the context of the blotting out of the sins of God's people. And I'm not going to take the time to explain that, but to be perfect is to have, to have your sins blotted out. Because when you look at these heroes of faith, there are people mentioned in that chapter that are in heaven now. Enoch is in heaven now, Moses is in heaven now, and even though Elijah isn't mentioned by name, he was translated without seeing death. There were the first fruits that were raised with Christ at his resurrection, and what does it mean for them without us to not be made perfect? Well, it's because their sins have not yet been blotted out. And then in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's what Paul is saying. 
there is going to be a group of people who experience the third angel's message at the end of time that will allow Christ to finish his work as high priest in the sanctuary of heaven above. And when Christ finishes that work as our great high priest, he will blot out the sins of all the saints, all of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, and those who are alive at the end of time. Because the, those who are living at the end of time, the 144,000, they will run with patience the race set before them. They will look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, we have a race to run. It's a race to run where we are to lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us so that Christ can cleanse us from sin through his power and strength so that he can have a sanctuary cleansed in heaven above. And when he has a group of people who run this race, they will have the experience of the third angel's message of having patience and of being like Jesus. How do we run this race? We look into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He died on the cross, but he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This race takes us from the cross to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, just like the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. And when that work is finished, we will see something very amazing happen. And I want to take you to Revelation chapter 15 as we close. Revelation chapter 15 is a very fascinating chapter. It, it occurs just after the three angels' messages are described in the great harvest. Then in Revelation chapter 15, starting in verse 1, you see a sign in heaven, the seven angels having the seven last plagues. They're filled up with the wrath of God. Then you see the, the 144,000 singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And then in verse 5, it says, And after the I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven last plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So at this point, the sanctuary in heaven is open, and now the seven last plagues are being poured out. Smoke from the glory of God fills the temple. No man can go into the temple. This is the close of probation. And the question is, what is happen, happening during the time that the seven last plagues are being out. We see that smoke fills the temple, and when you look at the experience in the sanctuary message, if you go um, to the book of Leviticus, you see that as the high priest finished his work in the most holy place, he came out of the sanctuary through the holy place into the outer courtyard, and then he laid the sins of God's people, whose sins have been blotted out, onto the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat was led out into the land or into the wilderness, the land of forgetfulness, by a fit man. And so what's happening here prophetically is probation has closed. Jesus has come out of the most holy place. He's taken off his priestly garments. He's put on his kingly garments. In the meantime, he's placed the sins of God's people onto the head of Satan, the scapegoat. And now the fit man is going to lead Satan out into the land of forgetfulness. Because at this point, when probation closes, Christ has a people his 144,000 who have been cleansed of sin. Notice what Ellen White says. This is Spalding and McGann Collection, page 2, paragraph 1. Then I saw that Jesus' work in the sanctuary will soon be finished, and after his work there is finished, he will come to the door of the first apartment and confess the sins of Israel upon the head of the scapegoat. Then he will put on the garments of vengeance. Then the plagues will come upon the wicked, and they do not come till Jesus puts on that garment and takes his place upon the great white cloud. Then while the plagues are falling, the scapegoat is being led away. He makes a mighty struggle to escape, but he is held fast by the hand that leads him. If he should effect his escape, Israel would lose their lives. I saw that it would take time to lead away the scapegoat into the land of forgetfulness after the sins were put on his head. This is what I see. The fit man represents the 144,000 because they are the people through whom 
Christ has cleansed them of sin as he has finished his work in the sanctuary. He then comes out of the most holy place and he puts the sins of God's people under the head of Satan and now the plagues start to be poured out on the wicked. This is when God's people go through what is known as Jacob's time of trouble. And this is what Satan is saying to God in the great controversy. Satan is saying, you're saying that after probation closes that they won't need a mediator and they won't sin anymore. But God, I'm telling you, when push comes to shove and the great controversy is on the line, I am going to get that fit man to let go of his grasp because I'm going to bring the strongest temptations they've ever seen in their lives and I know that I've gotten them to sin before and I'm going to get them again, God. And Jesus is saying, just wait and see. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And Jesus is betting the great controversy on the fact that when he cleanses his remnant, his advent movement, his Laodicean church, so that he can place his seal in our foreheads, that the mystery of God is fully and completely accomplished. He is guaranteeing that we as his people will lead Satan as the fit man into the land of forgetfulness so that he will never be seen from again. We will prove through God's strength and power that it is possible to follow God fully and completely, that his law is a fair law, that it can be kept, and that even though we are the weakest of the weak living at the worst time of earth's history, the power of God is omnipotent and we can defeat Satan in the great controversy. So what is Adventism's prophetic role in the great controversy? It's to allow God to prove through us that Satan is wrong in his charges against God. And you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to wake up to that reality. We need to stop siding with Satan in the great controversy, saying things like, oh, I can't really overcome sin. Oh, keeping the commandments is legalism. Oh, the spirit of prophecy doesn't really matter. No, when you do that unwittingly, you are aiding Satan in his fight against God. And we as Seventh-day Adventists need to, ra to rise up to the challenge that God has given us and say, you know what? We are sinful, weak human beings who have fallen short of the glory of God. But God is an omnipotent God. He is a powerful God. He is a loving God. He is a merciful God. When I see Jesus dying on the cross, I want a Savior like that. I want a Lord like that. I will be crucified with Christ so that Christ can come into my heart. He will live out his life through me. I will live by the faith of Jesus. I will live an obedient life. And when the history of the great controversy is written, it will be said of the Advent movement. Here was a, a group of people who learned to follow Jesus fully and completely so that they would have the patience of the saints, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I just want to make an appeal to you today. This is the message for our time. It's time for us to stop playing games with the fallen churches of Babylon. It's time for us to show Babylon how beautiful and powerful this message is. And if you want to be part of such a powerful and closing work, I would invite you to stand with me as far as possible as we have a closing prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the work that you have given us to do, for the identity that you have given us that drives our mission. And I just pray that we would learn to surrender our lives fully and completely to Jesus so that it can be said of us that Christ lives in us, the hope of glory. That Christ is cleansing us from sin. That as he began to deal with the sin problem and bring in everlasting righteousness on the cross, that in our lives, that everlasting righteousness will be seen. That the sin problem will finally and fully be dealt with and that we will learn to fully trust in Jesus so much that we will be a complete demonstration of his character. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for our sins for where we have fallen short. We're thankful that you're a merciful and forgiving God. And we're also thankful that you're a powerful God that enables us to live righteous lives through faith. Be with each person here at this ASI convention. May we go forward to complete the work that you have given us to do. And bless us throughout the rest of this convention. May we receive a blessing from all the meetings that we will attend. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.